Well, welcome everyone. Again, thank you for your patience. Um, wanted to make sure we get as many folks joining in as possible. Good evening, my name is Sandy Kerr and I will be your Zoom host tonight. Uh, before we get started, I'll just go over some of the basics, um, the Zoom basics. Closed captioning is available. Uh, to enable that, just click on the CC Live transcript box, which is in your Zoom taskbar. And if you want to move those the, the closed captioning around, just click and drag um, the box around on your screen. Um, all meeting participants other than myself and our presenter will be muted. Um, if you do want to ask a question or make a comment, you'll do that in the chat. And then all questions and comments will be addressed after the speaker concludes her prepared presentation. We will also, well, we are recording this, um, and it'll be, uh, the recording will be made available through our league's YouTube channel and on our website. And I'm gonna start tonight's program by acknowledging and honoring the ancestral stewards of this land on which we meet today. We in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, honor the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the great nations of Lenape and Delaware peoples. We honor all original nations of the past and those among us today. For those of you who aren't familiar with the League of Women Voters, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with a mission of empowering voters like you and defending democracy. When we say we're nonpartisan, that means that we do not support or endorse any candidates or political parties. Essentially, we don't care who you vote for, we just want you to vote. We educate voters and we advocate for public policy issues like the one we're gonna be addressing this evening. Our ultimate goal is to get as many people out to vote as we can because voting is the foundation of our democracy. And let me now introduce our speaker this evening. Let me just highlight her. I have to find her in the, hmm. Barry, I can't find you here. But anyway, I'm sorry. So our speaker tonight is Terry Carroll. And Terry is a semi-retired occupational therapist. She has spent the last 20 plus years working with children in school settings and several leadership roles. Her professional work often intersected with local and national legislative issues, highlighting that these actions impact everyday people's lives. Having a strong passion for ensuring we have an informed citizenry, she joined the League of Women Voters of Bucks County two years ago. She has since lent a hand to many of our league's activities and projects, which include tabling events, distribution of the voter's guide, and she serves as one of our at-large board positions. When there is spare time, Terry loves to bicycle, garden, learn from the Women's National Farm and Garden Network, and the hand weavers of Bucks County. And Terry resides in Doylestown Township. And I am going to spotlight her. Are you there, Terry? I am here. I'm Excellent. highlighted too, or spotlighted. <laughs> so thank you, Sandy. Thank you for those. Um, that great introduction. So, and welcome to everybody who is here tonight to learn about this important issue, because we are entering a very lively time in US politics. We're preparing for the 2024 presidential election. As our events of the past 20 plus years have shown, this is an always a routine event. There's been a lot of media coverage about the disputes over votes, and as we get closer to the big day, there's gonna be even more media focus on the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is of particular interest to the League of Women Voters. Why is that? The League believes that using the Electoral College to elect the president is unfair and bad for our democracy. We'll go over the reasons why it's time to abolish the Electoral College and use a direct popular vote to elect our president and vice president. And here, before I go any further, we'd like to find out 
how those of you who joined us tonight feel about this issue. So Sandy's gonna set up a poll, very short poll. If you could please take a minute to respond to that question and then we'll continue. Do folks see the poll? I saw it. Okay. I'll give a few minutes. Nobody's answered the question. Hopefully folks can see it. I was able to see it and respond. Okay. 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 For some reason, it's not collecting on my... It did not work. I see I two people. Oh. Oh. I'm seeing poll result, results. You are? Okay, great. Yes. The, at least three or four people put in the chat that they saw it and responded. So. Okay. Can you, I'm sharing the results. Can you see them? Yeah. All right. So I can see that and I can see we have a large percentage saying yes. Some saying 89% saying yes, 5% saying no, and 5% not sure. Okay, great. Okay. So, all right, great. With that, let's move on. So, so tonight we're going to talk about several things related. Let's let this this is our agenda for tonight. Let's start by sharing what the basics are. What is the electoral college, and what is the League of Women Voters' position on this method of electing our president? Next, we'll look at the problems caused by the Electoral College and how a direct popular vote would easily, easily solve this. Then we'll review the top arguments given in favor of keeping the Electoral College system and why those reasons are actually based on some very common myths. Finally, I'll explain what needs to be done to abolish the Electoral College, which is an amendment to the US Constitution. We'll have plenty of time to answer questions at the end. I ask that you hold those questions. Well, you can put them in the chat at any time. That's, um, we, but we probably won't answer questions till the end. There's a lot to get through here. So, all right. So what is the Electoral College? First of all, it's not a process. It's not a place. It's not a school or a building. It's a group of 538 people who elect the president and vice president every four years. According to the US Constitution, each state legislature gets to decide how its electors are chosen. Each political party has its own slate of electors. When you vote in a presidential election, you're not voting directly for a presidential candidate. Instead, you're voting for a group of state electors from the candidate's political party who have pledged to give their electoral votes to that candidate. Each state gets a specific number of electors based on their congressional delegation. There's one elector for each U.S. Senator, one for each U.S. Representative. So for example, Pennsylvania had 20 electoral votes in 2020. That's going to go down to 19 in 2024. Uh, Texas has lost 30, uh, I'm sorry, had 38 in 2020, while Rhode Island had four. The District of Columbia gets three electors, even though it's not a state. So you can see how the number of electoral votes, there's a rough correlation with um, their legislative representation. Importantly, the winner of the Electoral College is not whoever gets the most electoral votes. The winner must have a majority of the electoral votes, over 50%. And that currently is 270 electoral votes. 
If no candidate gets 270 electoral votes, then the House of Representatives chooses the president. Each state gets one vote and the Senate chooses the vice president. Since 1970, the League of Women Voters has held a position that the direct popular vote method for electing our president and vice president uh, is essential to a representative government. The League of Women Voters believes that the Electoral College should be abolished. This is not a new issue for the League, nor is it, as you'll find going forward, a new issue for our nation either. So what's wrong with the Electoral College? Let's go over some of the problems that the League has identified. Some of the problems are pretty visible during a, pre during a presidential election, but others are historical issues that you may not have heard of. So let's go back in history a bit to the very beginning when the Electoral College was established at the Constitutional Convention in our hometown of Philadelphia during the long hot summer of 1787. After we won our independence from England, our new country needed a national constitution to strengthen its federal government. Each of the original 13 states could send delegates to the Constitutional Convention. 55 attended. All the states were represented except Rhode Island did not send any delegates. So 12 of the 13 states had representatives. And there were many, many famous people there George Washington, Ben Franklin, James Madison, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, among others. The delegates had the task of creating a new system of government, and there were many debates and many arguments. The one about electing a president was one of the first arguments to arise, and it was one of the last to be resolved. And it was resolved through a compromise idea that ultimately came to be called the Electoral College. Why was the Electoral College created? One big reason is slavery. The Electoral College served as a compromise that gave the Southern states more voting power in presidential elections by partially counting enslaved people towards their populations, even though these people did not have the right to vote. The three-fifth compromise, a person being uh, an enslaved person being three-fifths of a person counted in enslaved people, um, and it had already been used to count the number of representatives for that, for this, that the Southern states had in the House of Representatives. And because the Electoral College is based on the number of members that each state has in Congress, this got carried over into the presidential elections. When it came to deciding how to elect the president, there was a big rift between the North and the South, not because there were more people living in the Northern states than in the Southern states. And this bar graph illustrates that very nicely. There was approximately the same number of people living in the Southern states as the Northern states. You can see at the top of each bar graph that's here, the total number of people, 1.7 million in the Southern states, 1.8 in the Northern states. But the colors in those bar graph, the bars show you how many were free people and how many were enslaved. So the gold represents free people and the purple represents the enslaved people. So there was a large, a much larger number of enslaved people in the Southern states. So that being the case though, the Southern states still had a much smaller voting population than the Northern states because over a third of their population was enslaved and they weren't voting. So as a result, the Southern states adamantly refused a direct popular vote for president. Leading up to the convention, everybody thought that the battles between the smaller and the larger states, uh, expected battles between the smaller and the larger states in terms of population. But James Madison's quote here, I think is it kind of summed it up very nicely. It seems now to be pretty well understood the real difference of interest lies not between the large and the small, but between the northern and then the southern states. 
the institution of slavery and its consequences form the line of discrimination. If the racism of the Electoral College had ended when slavery did, we wouldn't be talking about this tonight. But the Electoral College continued to silence Black votes after the Civil War. So there's an interesting history and in how the Electoral College ushered in the Jim Crow era, which lasted almost 100 years. During the period right after the Civil War, called Reconstruction, federal troops were stationed in the South. They were there to enforce the civil rights of the formerly enslaved Americans. During Reconstruction, Black men voted and the first Black representative served in Congress. But in the 1876 presidential election, much of that progress was undone. The popular vote, this was this was the election where Sam, Samuel Tilden ran against Rutherford B. Hayes, and Tilden won the popular vote. But there were allegations of voter fraud in four states. Both parties claimed victory. So as a result, Tilden even though we got the popular vote, didn't get a majority in electoral college. So the two parties came up with a compromise and that traded the newly awarded rights of black people to shore up the malfunctioning electoral college, allowed Hayes to become president, but to become president, and when he did, federal troops were removed from the South. So the states of the former Confederacy without federal troops there were once again allowed to rule themselves and they started passing a series of laws known as Jim Crow laws. And during that era, the voting rights of black people were systematically destroyed by state laws and local ordinances. There were poll taxes and literacy tests and that lasted almost a hundred years until the Civil Rights Act of 1965 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I may have misspoke. Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965. So the Electoral College was created because of slavery and the failure of the Electoral College in 1876 allowed racism to flourish. Unfortunately, this problem didn't end with the Voting Rights Act. Even today, statistical analysis shows that states with lower black populations have more voting power in the Electoral College and vice versa. While this may not be intentional, it's still having an impact. Perhaps this will reduce over time, but a direct popular vote would immediately address this by making every vote count as one vote, regardless of race and demographics. Most people aren't aware that the racist theory history, the racist history of the Electoral College has other issues. But this is besides the racism. So what are some of these issues that we have? What do some people dislike about the Electoral College? One of the first one that you may have heard is the Electoral College turns losers into winners. Five times in our country's history, the Electoral College has awarded the presidency to candidates who lost the popular vote. The bar graph shows those five elections here. Two of them have occurred in the last 20 years. A lot of us are familiar of the outcome of the um, 2016 and the 2000 elections. These elections create confusion and frustration and they undermine voters' trust and confidence in our election system. So I like these graphics, the, the purple showing who won the popular vote and the gold bars showing who, act, who um, actually became president. A direct popular vote for president would ensure that the candidate who gets the most votes from the people would actually become the president every time. Another problem is that the Electoral College doesn't treat voters from different states equally. It makes some votes count more than others, depending on where the voter happens to live. 
And that's because the number of electoral votes given to a state isn't exactly proportional to its population. No matter how many people live in a state, it gets two electoral votes based on its two senators. So votes from smaller states have their votes weighted more heavily in the electoral college the votes from larger states. So if you look at our the graphic in the slide here, you can see in the table on the left side um, in Delaware, which has a population of 990,000 and three electoral votes, those three electoral votes represent 330 people. But in the Pennsylvania, which has a much larger population of 13 million, we have we have more electoral votes, we have 20 electoral votes, but each electoral vote then is equivalent to 650,000 people. That means if you move uh, move from Pennsylvania to Delaware, you would double the power of your vote. And this is even more extreme in some other um, comparison states. For example, one vote in Wyoming has the same impact as four votes in Florida. fundamental principle of the United States is that one person has one vote. And that's the standard for every other election in this country. And it should be one person, one vote for our presidential election. And that's how it, it would be if we had a direct popular vote for president. Under the electoral college system, most states are considered safe with easily predictable election results. This means that candidates can feel comfortable ignoring this, those safe states and focusing their attention money on the few swing states. These swing states get all the candidates' attention. And they have much greater influence on the candidates' policy positions than the rest of the country. We live in one of those swing states, at least at this time, and that might seem like a perk, but it's important to understand how unfair the focus on so few states is. And it's important to remember that swing states change over time as demographics and political parties evolve, so we may not always be one. In uh, 2012, Colorado was considered a competitive state and it got lots of camp campaign attention in the um, elections between two. Uh, 2004 and 2012, but now it's considered a blue state, so it doesn't get the same focus we do. So I like this map here. The, the uh, swing states are represented in purple. The dark purple ones probably being, being in the top tier swing states, and Pennsylvania being one of them, all right? And the light purple being a second tier. But this group of states here is, is home to about 40% of our population, but they get 100% of the TV ad spending and 98% of the campaign events. Uh, I'm sorry, that was in 2020. We got 100% of TV ad and 98% of the, of the campaign events. Isn't that big a surprise? We're so used to that in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure we people have had plenty of that already. With the direct election by popular vote, candidates wouldn't be forced to pay would be forced to pay attention to the entire country, not just a handful of states. All 50 states, including the District of Columbia, would require consideration from presidential candidates. In addition to only a few states, most uh, getting attention. The Electoral College can discourage people in the safe states from voting altogether. Hopefully in our state, we realize we have a big impact and everybody in Pennsylvania gets out to vote. But voters in safe states often feel their votes don't matter, which decreases turnout. And you can see in this bar graph, which illustrates that in 2016 voter turnout and 2020 voter turnout. The bar graph shows you the percentage of eligible voters who cast a vote for president, and it was significantly lower in the safe states. Um, the safe states are represented in gold, and the swing states are represented in the purple. So that turns into, so a, that could be a difference of six to seven percentage points, that, which might be, be small, 
but that's 15 million registered voters who chose not to vote in 2020, and that could change the outcome of an election. So this is an issue that affects both political parties. If you're a Republican voter in a blue state or a Democratic voter in a red state, you feel like your vote for president never counts, so why bother? On the flip side, Republican voters in red states and Democratic voters in blue states feel like the party doesn't need their vote, that it's a given. So millions of people just don't bother to vote. But in a direct popular vote for president, voter turnout will increase, making every vote count and count equally. Since almost all states use the winner-take-all system, the Electoral College disregards any votes for candidates who don't win that win the state. When a candidate gets 51% or 90, whether a candidate gets 51 or 90% of the vote, that candidate takes all the state's electoral votes. If a candidate expects to win in his state, they can safely disregard the undecided voters in that state and just stop campaigning altogether. So this, this uh, map on the slide of New Jersey, is a which is generally considered a, a reliably blue state, um, but in, I believe this is 2020, if I'm not mistaken. So around in 2020, around 41% of the voters, or which is 1.9 million people voted for Donald Trump in 2020. Since all of New Jersey's 14 elective votes went to Biden, those that voted for Trump were counted at the national level. So, and you can see the the uh, the blue and the the blue and the red or pink represent gradations here. But you can see which counties in New Jersey uh, really weren't represented in the electoral college in 2020. A direct popular vote would encourage candidates to compete for all voters' votes. So making it easy to cheat, even after all our votes are cast and counted, the Electoral College leaves our presidential elections more vulnerable to manipulation and even outright, outright fraud. It provides partisan operatives with a roadmap for overturning election results. So in the 2020 election, the margin of victory was 38 electoral votes instead of three and a half million popular votes. Because those electoral votes came from only a few states, overturning the election would have been possible by finding fewer than 43,000 ballots in three states, Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Using the popular vote would almost always mean a much larger margins, making fraud and bad faith challenges much more difficult to pull off. So, so there's a lot of myths and arguments about uh, why it's important to keep the Electoral College and what the problems would be with the Electoral College. So many of the arguments come from people who are concerned about trading one type of unfairness for another. Um, so, But fortunately, these objections to a popular direct vote are based on myths that aren't backed up by facts. So let's take a look at some of them. So. Number one, without the Electoral College, our presidents would be chosen by a couple of big states like California and New York. So people argue that the Electoral College is needed to keep the small states from being overwhelmed by large states in the presidential election. If we take a look at the graphic here from the 2012 presidential election, Barack Obama needed about 63 million votes to win the election. This chart breaks down the, cumul the accumulation of votes he received in 39 states, starting with California is on the very, very far left. I'm not sure if the, you can see that on this slide. It looks like the, the state's names aren't showing on this. But California is the one on the far left with a little bar. And as you go across, the vote count starts to go up to the 63 million that he needed to vote from, in, and he got it from the 39 states. So... That's a large majority, not just a handful. That's just not three, two or three states that got him over the top. So 
simply mathematically impossible for an election by popular vote to be determined by the largest states. The fact that direct election by popular vote means that votes from most or all states would be needed to win the presidency. Every vote would count, count the same, no matter where the voter lives. Okay. Another myth. Myth number two. People have supporters of the Electoral College have concerns about the cities, the big cities, that without the Electoral College, our presidents would be chosen by a few of our biggest cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Cities are the major population centers, but they don't represent as much of the country's population as we think we do. And these pie charts are a really nice graphic uh, and way of looking at that. So here's our cities that in the bar chart, uh, pie chart on the far left, you can see New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago represented by that little tiny purple slice of the pie, which represents 5% of the population. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is 5% of the national voting age population. I think that's important to remember here that they're talking about people who are eligible to vote, not, not underage individuals. That's certainly not enough to decide an election. So let's move on to the middle pie. That represents the, the 10 biggest cities in the country. That would add up to 8%. That would add 8% of the voting age population. Still not enough because there's still 92% of, of everybody else of voting age outside of those cities. Moving over to the right pie, when we go to the 50 biggest cities, they make up just 15% of the voting age population in this country. So big cities are purple in here and that me that medium gray color, that's the rural. So big cities, rural, 14% rural, 15% cities, still not enough because there's still 71% representing smaller towns and suburbs. There's just not enough people living in big cities to decide our president on our own. Most people live in those small, that 71%, the smaller towns and the suburbs. So it's mathematically impossible for an election by popular vote to be determined by just the largest states or the largest cities. Once again, direct election by popular vote would ensure every person's equally represented regardless of where they live. Myth number three, when we consider the last two elections when the popular and the electoral vote winners were different uh, in 2000 and 2020, it's easy to think that abolishing the electoral college would only benefit democratic candidates. But let's look at the 2004 presidential election between George Bush and John Kerry. So the map of the United States on the left in the slide is the electoral college map for the 2004 election where Bush won over John Kerry with 3 million more popular votes than Kerry, all right? So you see your, your typical red and blue states represented here. The map to the right shows how close Bush came to winning the popular vote, but losing the electoral college. And I'm not sure if anybody can see, but it's one state and it's, a li little hard to see on this map, but it's the state of Ohio. So if John, if Ohio had turned blue uh, and John Kerry had received only 119,000 more votes in Ohio, he would have won the Electoral College and the election, even though Bush would have had nearly 3 million more popular votes. So in that case, that would have hurt the, the Democratic Party. So the and so it shows that the electoral college can hurt either of our two major political parties, and this is not a partisan issue. All right. Myth number four pertains to the making amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Everybody agrees that if people all agree that the electoral college is a problem. 
one of the biggest obstacles can be pessimism. A lot of people feel that it, the Electoral College can never be abolished because it takes a constitutional amendment to do so, and that is never going to happen. So, but if we take a look at the graphic here, each bar here is representing amendments to the Constitution, and over time, you can see that our history shows clusters of time when there was constitutional activity uh, with large gaps in between when there was not. So between the first two clumps, there's six, a 60 year gap. The second gap, there's 18 years. And then, um, then a gap of 21 years and between uh, before the Twenty Seventh Amendment was was uh, came into uh, came into play in nineteen ninety two, if I'm not mistaken. So it's been another thirty one years. Now the interesting thing about this is why why are these clusters of activity here? Why what what drove that kind of activity? If people are so com you know, it's so hard to get a constitutional amendment um, passed. They tend to be periods of great national political activities where citizens were feeling that our democracy was in crisis and where the demand for change across our society was persistent and it was loud. Right after the Civil War was one of them, the progressive period at the turn of the last century, the civil rights era in the 1950s and the 1960s. It seems we might be in the middle of another one of those periods of political activity and demand for change. Only time will tell, but our level of engagement now and concerns for the resilience of our democracy are remarkable. So what needs to be, how do we get there? How do we get, if we're going to make any changes on that? We focus on the goal of abolishing the electoral college by amending the Constitution, what will it take to get there? So to amend the Constitution, a bill has to be proposed that, that there, we amend the Constitution and it, that bill needs to pass both the US House and the Senate by a two thirds vote. It's not easy, it shouldn't be. Then the proposed amendment needs to be ratified by three fourths of the state's legislatures. That's 38 states. Not easy, but it's been done 27 times. It can happen again. So um, please note that the League of Women Voters is not advocating or supporting a need for a constitutional convention to accomplish th this. It can be done with the, the process that I just described here, and that would do the job of abolishing the Electoral College. So has there ever been any action in this matter? Well, there has been. Even though it didn't succeed, Congress took, it, took action between 1969 and 1970 to abolish the Electoral College. In the 1968 presidential election, Third party candidate George Wallace got 46 votes in the Electoral College. Both the Democrats and the Republicans were worried that Wallace's popularity could have prevented their candidates, Hubert Humphrey, Richard Nixon, from getting their, the required 270 votes in the Electoral College to win the election. That created a lot of momentum and incentive to take action. At that time, a Gallup poll showed that 81% of Americans supported abolishing the Electoral College. And a bill to amend the Constitution passed the House of Representatives by a 338 to 70 margin. That's pretty, pretty large bipartisan effort. However, the bill died in the Senate when it was filibustered by the Southern Democrats who feared their states would lose power in presidential elections because of their traditionally low voter, voter, voter turnout. Similar bills have been introduced as recently as 2021, but there has been no vote on these bills. The League believes this issue lacks momentum because of the defeatist attitude that it's never gonna happen. 
That's what we need to change. We need momentum and we need to remember that changing the constitution is possible. Okay, so before we go any further, um, happy to answer questions, but before we go to the questions, we wondered if we could revisit the question we asked at the beginning and if you would participate in a second poll. So Cindy's gonna put that up and if we could take a few minutes to see how you feel about the issue now. Remember to put any questions you have in the chat. And Terry, once again, I'm unable to see um, how people are responding. So we'll give it a minute or so and then um, I'll end the poll. Okay. All right. I'm going to give it a, okay. Have any minds changed? That's the question. <laughs> oh, looks like they may have. All right. You. <laughs> I think we were at 89% on the last poll for yes. Yep. Great. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we are going to take questions in the chat. So I'll give you a minute to um, put any questions you have for Terry. The first question I see here is what is the influence of gerrymandering on the electoral college? That's a really good question. I think it that's that's kind of a very um it's it I think it's kind of hard to answer that. It probably mat matters a lot in what the intent of the gerrymandering was because gerrymandering and I'm not an expert on that at all. <laughs> and maybe somebody else can chime in who might knows knows a little bit more of that. I think that's an that's an attempt to kind of shape the electorate in a given area. And and shape it in favor of one party or another party. I've I'm not aware of any efforts to use gerrymandering to influence the electoral college. Um, but if somebody else has some knowledge of that, feel free to feel free to let me know. I'm not aware of that. So if anybody else does, so okay. Um... Another question, is there a movement now to eliminate the Electoral College? As far as I know, the League is the big one, <laughs> the big proponent behind that, aside from um, the individuals who put that bill out in um, trying to get something that the bill that they tried to get introduced in uh, two, uh, 2000 and uh, 21 had a lot of bipartisan people signed on onto it. I'm sorry, I don't have that then all the names, but there are a lot of names signed on to that bill. But um, I don't know that it's um, it's front and center right now at all. They're having trouble getting routine things like budgets done. So, another question: Is there any way to pass to bypass the electoral college without an amendment? I think that's the only way that it can be done right now. But I would say there, there maybe there could be enough an impact on the electoral college without eliminating it, um, and that's that's a topic for another discussion called the National Interstate Compact. But I I will put that aside. That's um, it's 
it's it's that 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 would not eliminate it. To eliminate it, you would need uh, um, an amendment to the constitution. And the league, and I have a slide on that towards the end, but we're going to have a program on the um, on the national popular vote interstate compact in April. Um, so tune in for that and you'll hear more about it. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so here's a um, question. Since three quarters of the states are required to ratify, don't more than one quarter benefit from the Electoral College? I'm not sure I really understand the question. So, um, I, I believe, we believe that everybody benefits from this. It, and it's not so much a, a question of which states choose to vote for it against it. It would, the intent is it for to benefit every single voter in the United States. Right. Um, I have a comment here around gerrymandering. And so this is an important point. Gerrymandering could yeah. affect the outcome of the election if the election goes to the House with one vote per state. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, right. So if you remember, um, it takes a majority. And if you don't have a majority, then it's the House of Representatives that elects, chooses the president, right? Right, okay, good point. Mm -hmm. And another comment here, and I thank everyone for the comments. Gerrymandering concentrates voters into extremes. This empowers extreme positions. Gerrymandering decreases the chance of representatives to stand up for an amendment. Right. Another good point. Thank yeah, you. Right. Yeah. Very good points. Thank you. So. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna go back to um, sharing my screen. So as I mentioned, um, we are having another program about electing the president and it's called Electing the President, Past, Present and Future. And that is gonna be held on April 16th on Zoom. You can find the registration um, link on our website, lwvbucks.org, or if you want, you can scan the QR code. Um, let's see. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that we do have an election coming up. <laughs> okay, folks. So, um, April 23rd, if you haven't registered or importantly, if you wanna change your registration, I know there are some folks who are registered independents or unaffiliated voters who choose to change their registration for the primary since we have closed primaries. You still have time to do that. Um, the voter, the registration deadline is April 8th. Of course, if you wanna vote by mail, please get your application in by April 16th. And if you want to get information about the candidates and a personalized ballot, go to vote411.org. And you put in your, your home address and it gives you your ballot and information about all the candidates that are running. So wonderful resource. Mm -hmm. So I wanna thank Terry again. Um, and all the folks who are involved in putting this program together. And of course, thank you who joined us tonight. I do appreciate um, the comments and the questions and, um, and your patience as we worked around a couple of technical issues. We, we did record this and we will email the recording link to everyone registered and it'll of course be available on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, Finally, I wanna just take a moment to invite those of you who are not already members to join the League of Women Voters. Um, our Bucks County chapter has over 200 members who are very passionate, like Terry is, about our mission to empower voters and defend democracy. And we're always excited to um, welcome new members 
and the new energy and ideas that they bring with them. So visit our webpage. Um, there's a big join button on the webpage, or you can reach out to any of our members to join. So thank you so much for your time, and we hope that you will continue to engage with us. Join us on the uh, 16th um, and continue to engage with us in the future. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.